Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. It's Unpacking Peanuts where we're going to finish up the monumental year of 1958. I'm your host, Jimmy Gownley. You might know me from my comic book series, Amelia Rules, or my graphic novel, Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up and the Dumbest Idea Ever. Joining me, as always, are my co-hosts. He's a playwright. He's a composer, both for this podcast and for his band, Complicated People. And he's the cartoonist behind such great strips as Strange Attractors, Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River, Michael Cohen. Hey there. And he's the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000. He is a former vice president of Archie Comics, and he's the cartoonist behind the Instagram strip Sweetest Beast, Harold Buckholtz. Hello. All right. So last week, I I left you with a cliffhanger. I'm going to tell you my grand theory of art, and uh, I asked you to contemplate how important happiness is. So just to tell you, you were speaking, Harold, to the fact that at this point, Schultz was able to capture many moods within a single comic strip, right? Could Mm -hmm. you explain that again a little bit for people who just uh, are tuning in this week? Right. So I've been doing this happiness index uh, against this anger index each year to see if there's a strip that has at least one character in one panel showing either anger or happiness as I can best determine, which is uh, an art more than a science. And what we noticed this year versus last year is that the anger index and the happiness index increased markedly, particularly the happiness index. So obviously Schultz is putting more of emotion into this year's strips than last year's, as far as I can tell. How this ties into my my grand theory of art, which I will not lay all on you at this point, because that would bore everyone to tears. It would be grand. I think it would be grand. I think in a work of art, and it doesn't matter if it's if it's a, a poem or if it's a TV show or if it's a comic strip, whatever, when you can vary the moods. And you could take someone from to the the absolute depths, but then bring them up to the absolute heights. Or you could put cruelty right next to humor. Or you can take pain and actually turn it into humor or joy. That is the highest thing that art can do. And when you're able to vary those moments up and vary those moods up enough, it actually takes the the reader or the consumer of the art off balance. It brings them out of their own comfort zone where they're trying, I think, to always stay within a certain range emotionally. They have to for their jobs and their families and stuff like this. But this takes them to a place that's a lot raw, that's a lot more like your first crush or something like that, where things are very, they're highs and lows and they come together very quickly. And I think in those moments, you might actually be able to change someone. It's it, it, it's going to be subtle, but over a long period of time, I really think you can have that effect on on people, and I think that's what we're seeing seeing Schultz do, and I think that's amazing. It's the one thing I I always try to do and wish I could do better in my own art is to be able to because that's how life is, you know. And I do see that in your work, Jim. I think that's one of the reasons I was attracted to it initially. For those of you who don't know. Um, Jimmy and I worked together uh, for a number of years uh, uh, on his work, his his, his comic, particularly Amelia Rules, uh, his graphic novel series. And uh, so did Michael. Michael and Jimmy worked together through uh, creating Renaissance Press, um, which included um, works that uh, Michael was was compiling and contributing to, as well as uh, Amelia Rules. So I'm very familiar with Jimmy's work, and I was attracted to it i think for for the reasons jimmy's describing there are not a lot of artists who are doing this and there's i think there's two pieces to it jimmy don't you think it's one of them is that yeah somebody can be taken to a raw place and that might lead them to change but you know you're you're the creator of this of the world and you're the in a sense in essence you're the god of the the story and mm-hmm. i think that's the other piece of it that i don't see very often in art is I place myself in the hands of the creator and I, if I'm going to go there, if I'm going to go to some raw place, I want to trust the person who's taking Mm -hmm. me there that they are Mm going to take me to a better place ultimately. 
And mm -hmm. back to your point about happiness, uh, is happiness overrated? And I, I think it is. I think happiness is overrated. I think joy is greatly underrated. Um, mm. And I feel that you have, in many cases, been able to, to get us to the place of joy uh, in your work. And that's what I really, really appreciate about, about what you do. It's, it's, it's not easy. It requires, um, uh, a level of commitment to your audience and to the story and the characters that you make to be true to them. And these are all things we see in Schultz's work that I, I you have emulated. And I think that's, and then brought your own unique take on them that I hugely appreciate. Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say, and I, I'll send you a check for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me ask you this, though. Can, can you describe what you said? Uh, joy is underrated and happiness is overrated. Can you tell me what the distinction in your mind is between those two? To me, happiness is is a contentment of where things are at the moment. And I think, uh, for example, this the strip with the characters taunting Charlie Brown that we were featuring uh, toward mm -hmm. the end of last week's session. Um, those characters are happy. They're in a place where they feel comfortable taunting Charlie Brown but it is not a place of joy it uh, to me joy is transcendent joy has to do with something that's bigger than yourself that you're entrusting yourself to that brings you to a place that you get outside of yourself and you you're you're part of something bigger in a way that makes you live a better life i guess that's the best mm -hmm. way i could describe it no, that's good what do you think michael is joy overrated or is happiness rather overrated i'm not sure what it is <laughs> <laughs> um well there's i mean a lot of different emotions blended into it i mean there's satisfaction and security and a lot of things that Schultz deals with if, if you're talking in a work of art i really agree with what you're saying about you need the two polar opposites to work against each other I tend to like dislike comedies that are just flat out trying to make you laugh no matter what. Mm -hmm. it's just Any examples you could give of laugh. something that people. Well, I don't like the Harvey Kurtzman strips you were we were talking about last week. What uh, joke, like look. joke, Where joke. It's like he's doing everything to make you laugh. He's mm -hmm. like throwing everything against the wall to make you laugh. Yeah, the, the, the stuff I really like is are the things that work on both at the same time. Which is something the Beatles the Beatles can do. Yeah. You know, you have a, even a song like Day in the Life, which is probably one of the saddest songs. Yeah. It still has that bridge where McCartney's like, Broke up hair and going on yeah. the bus. <laughs> you know, you're going like, this is stupid. But it, it really works against each other. And that's what Schultz does. I mean, he very rarely is just all out, I'm going to do a funny comic yeah and one thing i've noticed in schultz's work is that if there he doesn't force an emotion right if if a, if a character he will tend toward neutrality like even no mouth on the character yeah. just an open eye that's just kind of staring it's like he he wants to make those moves count and he doesn't want to distract you from the things that don't count where you see a lot of cartoonists and i've been guilty of this and some of the stuff i've done where i'm going to over make characters overreact uh, to something that really doesn't deserve it. And therefore you you're taking the, you're taking the direction of where the, where you're focusing emotionally in the strip and you're, you're amping up something that shouldn't be amped up. And so when you do get to something that should be amped up, you're already there. And so the contrast isn't there. Well, and Schultz is great about that contrast. The strips I hate are the ones where, in the last panel, someone makes a joke and all the people around him are laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've actually talked about that a lot. There's like a whole subgenre of, of comics where the characters are smiling insanely in every panel, no matter what is happening in the story. Yeah. I, although I am a fan of the, the joke at the end when the, the legs are <laughs> up in the air and they've gone back and plopped backward based on the, well, whatever the other person said. And, and in regards to what you're just talking about, about the, the subtlety that he does in expression and how effective that is, I think that perfectly leads us into our next strip. Oh, wait, hold on. Record scratch sound. Uh, I skipped one. Let's go back for a second. March 17th. Charlie Brown and Shermie are sitting in Charlie Brown's living room, looking at some sort of strange contraption. 
Charlie Brown says, look, my dad gave me a toy printing press. Jeremy examines it as Charlie Brown continues. Now I can put out my own newspaper. This is a complete outfit, ink, type, newsprint, everything. Oh, and here's the most important item of all. Charlie Brown pulls out a slip of paper that says, a little slip of paper, which entitles me to an appointment with Jim Haggerty. It's a knee uh-huh. slapper. That is a knee slapper. <laughs> Tell us who Haggerty is. I'm assuming you know, Harold. Peanut obscurity explained. Yeah, Peanuts Obscurity explained here. So Jim Haggerty is the only person who has ever done both terms of a two-term president as press secretary. Wow. Yeah, that he's is under Eisenhower. Man. Yeah. Uh, I love the little miniature printing press. I would have loved to have something like this as a kid. Yeah, I had a mimeograph machine that we bought cheap at some antique store. And then <laughs> of course we- you did. Loved it, loved it. We we would make tickets for the Jerry Lewis muscular dystrophy telethon stuff. You know, they got everybody involved in the community. Uh, made little, yeah, made little uh, newspapers and things. It was fun. Harold, I can just picture you in your crib with your mimeograph machine. Oh, that's this beautiful spirit duplicator smell. Mm. <laughs> that's a good smell. <laughs> Do not try that at home. March twenty third. Lucy is watching television. Linus comes up behind her and asks, what are you watching? Lucy says, none of your business. Linus says, I want to watch my program. Lucy's angry. She shouts, get out of here. Linus continues, you always get to watch your programs and I never get to watch my programs. Lucy stands up and clenches her fists. Do you want to get hit? I'll slug you a good one. Brother or no brother, I'll run roughshod over you. Linus walks past Lucy and begins adjusting the TV set. Lucy says, what are you doing? Linus says, I'm turning off your program and turning on mine. He turns to Lucy, a look of complete confidence and disdain on his face and says, you don't frighten me one bit. Linus sits in front of the TV, a big smile on his face, and Lucy cries to the heavens. Wah! The worm turns. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, I don't know if Linus continues this this trend of standing up for himself, but it's good to see it. Talking about a subtlety of expression, the next to last panel with Linus confronting Lucy, uh, just by the placement of his eyebrows and his eyelid, it's it's a masterful version of that type of just contempt uh, to look on someone's face. And I've never seen as good a version of it basically anywhere. Yeah. And, and again, what Schultz does really well, you know, actors are told when you've got your line and someone you're in the same shot with somebody and you don't have a line, you need to not make a move to pull the audience away from the character who's got the main moment. And he does that here. I mean, Lucy's yelling right in Linus's face and he is just deadpan staring at her and her nose is maybe three inches from his. And And then when he does it back to her, her response is total deadpan when he says oh, you don't frighten me one bit it's not till the next panel that we see her response that uh, you know really smart choices in taking you all across the map in terms of emotion in this one hey and if you're listening to us and you want to actually be able to see these strips you can just go to gocomics.com and type in peanuts it'll have every single strip uh, that charles schultz ever created in the 50 year run of this comic strip or if you want to get a little fancy about it Treat yourself to the Fantagraphics uh, Complete Peanuts collections. They're beautiful books. But either way, you can can follow along with us. And it's really worth doing because you're only getting half of it if if you hear the dialogue. The the artwork is, is just a joy to behold. April 6th. Schroeder is standing in front of a huge display of classical music LPs. He leaves the store and is proudly walking home with one. He comes upon Lucy, who says, What's that, Schroeder? Schroeder says, This is a new recording of Brahms' Fourth Symphony. Lucy asks, What are you going to do with it? Schroeder says, I'm going to take it home and listen to it. Lucy starts doing a little dance and asks, You mean you're going to dance to it? Schroeder says, No, I'm just going to listen to it. Lucy's marching around and says, Are you going to march around the room while you listen to it? Schroeder says, No, I'm just going to sit and listen to it. Lucy asks, you mean you're going to whistle or sing while you listen to it? Schroeder says, no, I'm just going to listen to it, and walks away. Lucy looks after him and says, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. (laughs) 
There are people out there who don't get music. I've run into some of them. Just like <laughs> music to them, music is a purpose. You need music. You need it for this. You need it for that. But just the music itself is like, why? Why would you listen to it? <laughs> you know, music is in a situation uh, in the same way as comics, really. In that, when we were younger, oh, back in the day when we were younger. Most comics were just out of print, even something like Peanuts, There, as we were understanding. Most of them weren't, re or not most of them, a, a large percentage of them weren't reprinted. And even if they were, they're reprinted in a paperback. You'd have to hunt down. You'd have to find it. You wouldn't have any kind of context for it. Records were the same way. I mean, it took me forever to find a copy of Pet Sounds, which is absurd, because now everything is available all the time. But I don't know that people have a richer appreciation of anything. In some ways, they might have less. Yeah, because everything is instantly available and at hand. It, the, the, the thrill of the hunt is certainly gone for finding things that you've heard you want to check out. I'd love the thrill of the hunt, especially with comics, too. And now, of course, everything's available everywhere. So, Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing about it is you would, it's not just the hunt, but there was an economic th thing where you'd have to pick you had a limited amount of money to spend and you'd have to pick something and yeah. then that was your entertainment until the next amount of money you were able to save up that amount of money right so the if you was a record that you spent your time on or your money on you're gonna spend a lot of time with that record you're just gonna listen to it and enjoy it more than you know when you could just make a playlist 80s hits or whatever and you don't even think about it mm -hmm. beautiful drawing of all the uh Records. I bet those are real record covers. Yeah, because he, we know he was a major uh, classical music fan, and uh, Brahms, by the way, is his favorite composer, not Beethoven. And I wouldn't be surprised if every single one of those is from his collection. Oh, I assume it is a hundred percent. April thirtieth, Charlie Brown and Violet are standing on the sidewalk. Violet says, "My dad has a better job than your dad. My dad has a bigger car than your dad." The third panel is silent as Charlie Brown thinks for a second. Then he says, my dad has a son. Yikes. I wouldn't touch this one with a 10-foot pole. I did not pick this one. I love, right. I love the third panel. I, I was the one who nominated this one because Charlie Brown has been, he's been pummeled with these things uh, for, for days by the time we get to this strip uh, between Violet and him. And I love the next to last panel where he's given this talk about happiness. So you got a big old smile, closed eyed smile, wide grin. Uh, uh, and Violet just feels like she's superior in every way to Charlie Brown. And, you know, given all the things that Charlie Brown could say that uh, there's something about this that is, is actually kind of touching to me because it's not just that he ha that his dad has a son and because Violet's a girl, it he doesn't have a son. It's like he's almost saying that that's that's of value to his dad. You know, it's Charlie Brown standing up for something potentially, depending on how you read it. That's it's true. He's not rubbing anything in. He's just he's he's giving something that on her terms she loses. Yeah. I think in that third panel, Charlie Brown is thinking. Boy, I've got a great rejoinder, but I'll probably get canceled. Yeah, <laughs> and then because he, he doesn't have a anyway. big grin on his face, he's just saying it very, very matter of factly. And the and the look on on Violet's face is priceless, where she's got the the Lucy eyes with the parentheses around them, and that slightly wiggly line where she's yeah, I, I can't even describe what that emotion is. You'd have to go and look on April thirtieth, but it, she's hunched slightly forward. It just you know, it's very subtle stuff, but well, yeah, it's also he moves in on the characters a little bit. They're much larger in the panel and just that last one. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. And the this gets slightly bigger from for first panel smallest. Yeah. Well, speaking of things that could get us canceled, I, I full <laughs> disclosure, I'm a 50 year old white man and I'm going to read this next strip and it contains a word that I think now is bad. It's it's an old fashioned word uh, for an indigenous person, but I'm just going to say it. If you don't want to hear it, skip 15 seconds ahead and we can talk about it on the other side. May 2nd. 
Charlie Brown is watching Linus, who's running around in the yard with his finger guns blazing. Bang, bang, yells Linus. Charlie Brown runs after him. Cops and robbers? Nope, says Linus. Cowboys and Indians, says Charlie Brown. Nope, says Linus. Linus continues running and yells, liberals and conservatives. I am pretty sure this is the first time I heard those words. <laughs> I don't remember. I remember not understanding this one. Interesting. Yeah. I don't remember seeing this one um, reprinted. I might be wrong. But I'm not saying it isn't. I mean, it, may, it yeah. certainly may have. Thankfully, this is a moment where we're able to look at something from far by, back in the past and go, well, luckily, we don't have to worry about things like that today. Right. <laughs> this is an obscurity. <laughs> the Peanuts time machine to last week, 10, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> May 15th. Charlie Brown and Schroeder are playing marbles. There's two silent panels. In the first, they're playing marbles. In the second, they seem to be aware of something, although we don't see what. In the third panel, we see they're playing next to a tree, and in the tree is perched Snoopy in his vulture guise. They both yell at Snoopy, Get out of here! Sending Snoopy flying from the tree. Yeah, no joke here. Except that Snoopy, that's Snoopy's greatest impersonation. He's done a lot, but the, the vulture is like <laughs> classic. Such a great drawing. I love when he does the vulture Snoopy. It's it's clearly that's that's has to be coming from his process of working by doodling something on a on a notepad without regards to a script first. You know, yeah. draw it. It's suddenly hey, that version of Snoopy looks like a vulture. The next thing you know, you have a few years worth of uh, of comic strips about it. <laughs> May 25th, Linus, decked in his full baseball gear, is standing in the outfield. He is, of course, sucking his thumb and holding his blanket. Behind him, hiding behind a rock, is perched Snoopy. Snoopy slowly begins to sneak up on Linus. Suddenly, Linus spots a high fly ball. At just the same moment, Snoopy attacks, grabbing Linus's blanket in his jaws. Snoopy spins Linus around then goes running, dragging Linus behind him. As Linus is being dragged behind Snoopy, he reaches out and makes a spectacular catch of the fly ball. On the bench sits Charlie Brown, the manager, who says, no manager in the history of baseball has ever had to go through what I have to go through. Here's a baseball strip. And it's also one of the Linus making a great catch while these other things are going on. I think this might be the third one of those. Yeah. What do you think of the image of uh, Snoopy seated on all fours uh, with Linus in four different angles of uh, being twisted around by, by Snoopy? Uh, that's basically it's, like it's, futurist art. That's like nude descending a staircase. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, it, it, and it's, it's funny because this is clearly, he developed this technique of loosely sketched multiple figures, I think last year. And he really mm-hmm. gets into it because there's a number of times he repeats that. And here he's pushing it to the point of, like I said, it looks like it completely looks like just a modern art composition. June 4th, Charlie Brown and Lucy are talking. Charlie Brown says, I guess one of the things we all have to learn is to live just one day at a time. Lucy says, I do better than that. I live just one second at a time. There, that was a good one. Here comes another one. There. I lived pretty good during that one. There. Oh, that was a happy second. There. Oh, I was real good during that one. Here comes another one. Charlie Brown says, I can't stand it. (laughs) I was real good during that (laughs) one. (laughs) This one seems a little awkward Uh, to me. It was never, uh, this was not reprinted. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it seems that, I mean, that's not really Lucy's character. And you don't think so? I just thought it is, it's, this one seems a little clumsy, but that's one out of 365. So <laughs> I kind of liked it because uh, Lucy's just playing off of Charlie Brown, trying to trying to think of some way to one up him in, in some inane way. And then she she totally buys into it for herself. I think it's that's classic Lucy for me. June 6th, Linus and Lucy are walking down the street. Linus says to Lucy, I have a lot of love in my heart. I love everybody. I love every living creature. Lucy asks, do you love snakes? Linus is indignant. He shouts back, of course I love snakes. Lucy says, do you love Gila monsters? 
Linus, fist raised to the air, shouts, I never heard of a Gila monster, but if I knew what it was, I'd love it. This is the this is the fanatic. Linus just goes to fanatic mode. <laughs> he can't just say I I like things. He has to go he loves every living creature in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I love that aspect of Linus. I think it's very fun. And it comes, you see it a little bit earlier where he's doing his I'm steadfast, unalterable, unyielding <laughs> sort of fanaticism. And I like that he's able to branch it out into various uh, mm -hmm. into various other disciplines. <laughs> June 22nd, Charlie Brown turns on the television set. Snoopy is asleep on top of the television set. He notices that Charlie Brown is watching the TV. Slowly, Snoopy maneuvers himself so that he is hanging off the edge of the top of the television set and watching the show upside down. Charlie Brown is annoyed that Snoopy is blocking his view, so he walks over to a little transistor radio and turns that on instead. As he sits enjoying the music, slowly Snoopy sneaks up again and this time covers the speaker with his ear. <laughs> this is wonderful, wordless comic by Schultz. He, he hasn't been doing a ton of them this year, but this is classic, cute Snoopy. It gives us a little bit of a precursor to Snoopy sleeping on top of the doghouse where he's on top of this gigantic console uh, asleep. But uh, it's just it's just adorable. Snoopy is is milking, milking his cuteness <laughs> for all it's worth in this strip. <laughs> Harold, what's a transistor radio? <laughs> Obscurity. Yeah, it was the hot thing. <laughs> Why don't you Google it, you blockhead? Here's a funny thing. Um, you know, Iron Man's suit in the original comics was all powered by transistors. Wow. <laughs> it was the hot thing. Yeah. One of Iron Man's little uh, contraptions in his suit in the early uh, issues is transistor-powered roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dick Tracy would be proud. Absolutely. July 4th. Charlie Brown is lying with his head in a dog's water dish. Snoopy looks on. In panel two, Snoopy walks by Schroeder, also lying with his head in a dog's water dish. Finally, in panel three, Snoopy notices Linus and Lucy both lying on the ground, their head in a dog's water dish. Snoopy thinks to himself in the last panel, Good grief, I think I found a new movement. This would, this would not make sense out of context. Because we've had a whole week or probably more of Snoopy discovering that if he lies with his head in the water dish, he's like blissfully happy. And this is kind of the finale of that whole sequence where everybody else is doing it. After after mocking him, everybody was making fun of him for doing this. Now they're all doing it. Yeah. And what's what's going on with the uh, the first panel there? Maybe this was never reprinted. That ear? The, the whole strip. Thing. Looks like it was redrawn by a warm Hershey bar. <laughs> You know, it's funny. We had uh, some interaction with one of our listeners uh, who was asking about seeing some of the panels that look different, or it looks like maybe somebody went in and tried to thicken up a line. I think in instances like this, it, it probably was something where it wasn't reprinted. The original art's gone. And all you're getting its source from is like a, a microfiche or a microfilm of, of the paper, one of the papers it ran on. And if that's the case, because apparently like Seth and Chris Ware, the cartoonists, donated a lot of their own collections no. to the Fanographics project to have the this complete series reprinted because a lot of these things were lost but these guys are fanatics Seth would just go to the library and just look through newspapers and find a peanut strip that he had never seen before and print it out so if that's the case and this was taken from a microfiche of you know the the Harrisburg Patriot or whatever it could be the person in the art department there that made those lines we have no way of knowing, but it certainly is, I don't think, what Schultz drew. Oh, uh, Seth is a cartoonist who also, he's very famous for um, drawing in the New Yorker style, but he also is uh, the designer who designed the complete Peanuts uh, books for Fanographics. He wrote such things as, it's a good life if you don't weaken, and my personal favorite, the great Northern Brotherhood of Canadian cartoonists. <laughs> July 7th, Schroeder is holding a toy gun with a bayonet and showing it to Linus and Charlie Brown. Linus says, A wooden rifle with a rubber bayonet? Boy, is that ever slick. Shermie rushes off playing army with it. A look of violence on his face as he yells, Arg. Linus looks off after Shermie and says, Gee, I wish I had one of those. 
Then he turns to Charlie Brown and says, I'm always intrigued by educational toys. Hey, this this is Shermie. Is this going to give us a, a chance to <laughs> visit the Shermometer? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Let's check the Shermometer, Charlie Brown. Let's fire it up. <laughs> what do we got? What is it? Is it aggression? Manic aggression. aggression? I could see that, yes. Violence? <laughs> I say aggression more than violence because he's not doing it. He's just, we don't see what he does. So, I, but he's definitely being aggressive. I, I have to make a slight confession here. I have not been 100% um, up to snuff on my record keeping <gasps> in regards to the thermometer. So oh, I'm going to oh. need to um, make a motion uh, for unanimous consent that we will officially, we will add whatever this trait is to the Shermometer, and then we will, if you both agree to it, we will sign off on the official list of Shermie traits and then take it from there. Does like, that make sense? I don't like signing things without checking with my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, I've pieced together what uh, what we've said about Shermie, and thus far, well, no, what, t- first off, tell me what, what this is. Are we going to go with aggression? Yeah, I, I like aggression. Yeah, but don't forget, we have another hypocrite thing from the One of the previous strips. Oh, so that is reinforcing hypocrite. This is interesting too, because maybe as we go forward, maybe we'll things will be removed from the shermometer. Possibly. As things change. Who knows? There's there's a lot that can happen here. All right. So we're gonna go with aggressive. We are adding aggressive to the list of Shermie's character traits, which makes him an aggressive, compassionate, patient, pedantic, emotional, good listening. Vain, friendly, hypocrite. <laughs> That's a pretty yeah, rich that character. Is a rich character. recipe for a popular comic strip character. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a was it Moritz of the Cats and Jammer Kids? <laughs> we have got to update our references. <laughs> That's only 118 years. I old. believe that we have mentioned one pop culture thing from this century. <laughs> so just just to Doja Cat, there you go. <laughs> now we're current. Good job. Huh? Got us off the hook. July twelfth. Lucy is hanging out at Schroeder's piano. She sighs to herself. Sick. She's looking at a little piece of paper. Schroeder questions what she's looking at. Lucy turns to him and says, "You're not the only fish in the sea." Then she holds up the piece of paper, which it turns out to in fact be a photograph and says van Clyburn. i don't think we need to explain that at all that's oh no did you guys know the story behind this i did not know i I know the story of van Clyburn. of course i do but i'll let you tell it (laughs) well yeah i wouldn't want to steal my thunder i appreciate the elvis presley of classical music whoa Yeah, he well, he was. And, you know, this is not just Schultz giving a nod to classical music and doing something obscure. This was actually a thing, and I had no idea. So Van Cliburn was 23 years old in 1958, and he, uh, he signed up to compete in the International Tchaikovsky Competition, which was set up in the Soviet Union, because he's a Russian composer, to... Um, essentially is a cultural outreach for the Soviet Union, an international cultural outreach, with the thought that most likely, given how huge Tchaikovsky was in in the Soviet Union, that the winner would be a Soviet Union artist, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Van Cliburn's from Texas, this 23-year-old. He comes and he totally charms the socks off of, of all the people at this competition. And he blows everybody out of the water he's just nobody had ever heard of this guy and he has this amazing amazing performance and then he winds up i think playing another another uh, traditional russian piece and everyone just falls in love with him there and the story goes that the judges went to khrushchev himself and said what should we do the best performance was by an american and he said well was he the best they said yeah he says well then give him the award and so van Clyburn wins the first international Tchaikovsky competition and makes headline news all over the world. And I don't know if this was a coincidence, but this strip came out on Van Clyburn's 24th birthday. Wow. You know, actually I do. I was teasing you at the top, but I do know a lot about this and I don't think people understand how 
hugely important this whole contest was and how different music could have gone um, if he hadn't won. Do you know who came in second? Not a lot of people. Yanni? What? Yanni? No. <laughs> uh, it was Albert Pace and Terhune. Uh... That's remarkable. I, well, he was a he was a multi talented uh, what artist. <laughs> what's going on with the sigh in the first panel? Why is it not centered in the word balloon? That's a good question. I think it looks to me like there was a word above it that was wow. Out. Could be, you know, maybe he had something. He's like, uh, it's just better with just the sigh. Just very strange because he never does. I mean, his lettering's flawless every day so it's just weird to see one where it's not a hundred percent and i don't know if you guys are are noticing around this time in the second half of the year again a lot going on in their lives that this is right at the time of their move probably when he's doing this but um look at lucy in the first panel and in the second panel both totally readable as lucy they're in the same pose but two very different lucy drawings uh he seems mm-hmm. to be doing that more in this period and i'm guessing Maybe he's just he is just a little bit rushed, a little bit harried at this point in his life. Because I, I think there's another strip I'll point it out as well. July 28th. Linus and Lucy are out in the field. Lucy is down on her knees looking at the ground intently. Linus says, Lucy, what's the difference between a bug and an insect? Lucy stands up and explains, well, physically, there's no difference at all. It's mostly a matter of class distinction. You know, birth, breeding, that sort of thing. Both kids get on their knees now and are looking at the bugs. Linus turns to Lucy and says, I sure envy you your knowledge of nature. I've learned a lot from these strips because I just make <laughs> stuff up when I don't know the answer to a question. <laughs> Does that works for you pretty <laughs> well. Seems to work pretty, works very well. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> you know, the other thing, before you could Google it, you blockhead, you could get away with saying a lot more. <laughs> outlandish stuff <laughs> i miss those. well days. you just quote wikipedia and you'll be good <laughs> that's true yeah august 5th in the foreground snoopy is dancing wildly charlie brown and linus look on from the background and linus says my grandma says that we live in a veil of tears charlie brown agrees she's right this is a sad world snoopy continues to dance happily in the third panel, Charlie Brown continues, this is a world filled with sorrow. We now see Snoopy, who's still dancing, but it's starting to hit him. In the fourth panel, Charlie Brown continues speaking, sorrow, sadness, and despair, grief, agony, and woe. This has reduced Snoopy to just a morose pile of a dog lying on his stomach oh. on the ground. Talk about going from a range of emotion here. Uh, he, he really plays yeah. with the taking Snoopy down and down uh, through this one. And also, this is an interesting strip for me because has uh, have they had the grandma quoted before? I'm not sure, but there is a grandma now just moved to Sebastopol. Yeah, right. So I don't know if any, there's anything going on. I do know that I believe Joyce's mom was going with Schultz. I think just the only two people from their family going to those Sunday school things that he was teaching uh, or at least leading. Um, was was uh, Joyce's mom, so the Veil of Tears reference is is a kind of an indirect biblical reference, as we were saying before. Schultz really is not going there at this point in his career. He, although he is now doing these religious strips, and this is also the year that the first mass market paperback collection of those Young Pillar strips is coming out. So a lot of people are seeing a side of Schultz outside of Peanuts that they didn't know about before. So it's interesting. Um, there's a there's a famous uh, hymn, I guess it's called Be Still My Soul, and veil is misspelled here. This is one of those, you know, terms that people get mixed up because the version that everybody thinks is the right way actually seems better than the real thing. Veil of Tears is such an amazing, an amazing evocative statement, but it actually is V-A-L-E, which is Valley of Tears, is what it's, it's right. supposed to mean. And it is it is a a, a very obscure translation that like the bishop's bible of 1568 uses it but it's not like in the king james or, or whatever might have been uh popular in the in the 50s but it is the v-a-l-e of tears is featured in yeah there's a famous hymn called be still my soul by Kat- katrina von schlegel uh, so oh. it, it was she dated albert i Jason think so yeah 
and Van Cliver did a beautiful version of the her her tune <laughs> on his third album. <laughs> Another side of Van Cliver. Veil with an V E I L Veil of Tears makes me think of Tolkien. Doesn't that isn't there some description of that? <laughs> A magical, right? like magical the, veil. Yeah, you write the veil if I, over swift. The sun rises over whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it reminds me of Tolkien. August 14th. Linus is staring up at the sky. He asks his sister, Lucy, why is the sky blue? Lucy already looks annoyed, by the way. And then she just turns and yells at Linus, because it isn't green. And she storms off a scowl on her face. Linus looks back up the sky and says, that just shows how stupid I am. I thought there'd be a more complicated reason. To this day, whenever anybody asks me, why is the sky blue? I say, because it isn't green. <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. It does. August 24th. Linus is sitting in his classic pose, sucking his thumb, holding his blanket. Snoopy is staring at him and looks annoyed. Snoopy rushes at him. And this time he's able to yank the blanket away from Linus, who chases Snoopy, who has gone into his doghouse. Snoopy peeks out from inside the doghouse as Linus is hiding and perched on top, waiting to spring. When Snoopy comes out, Linus makes his move and jumps, tackles Snoopy, grabs his blanket back and hauls Snoopy along with him. But Snoopy doesn't give up, so Linus does instead. And he is now back in his regular old sitting position, thumb in mouth, blanket up the cheek. But Snoopy is still hanging on to the blanket. <laughs> Look, yeah, now he's done that. He's done this a bunch of times. This Snoopy versus Linus's blanket thing, but it's just that Snoopy in the last panel, yeah. <laughs> still clinging there while Linus sucks his thumb. And isn't that picture of Snoopy in the in the doghouse looking out? intently with yeah. unbeknownst to him linus is on top of the doghouse looking down is just priceless i love that love brilliant that. august 28th charlie brown is holding an envelope lucy asks him what do you and this pencil pal of yours write about charlie brown puts the letter in the mailbox he says to lucy oh he tells me about his country and i tell him about ours lucy watches as charlie brown walks away then she yells you sound like a couple of spies to me <laughs> This is going to be a long sequence because um, it actually starts with him trying to be a pen pal and being unable to write with a pen without blotching the paper. So he tries that a bunch of times. So this is already well into this sequence. I actually have a question about this, Michael. As you, you are contemporary of Charlie Brown. Were you writing with dip pens in school? No, never. <laughs> never, right? So who who is he talking about doing this? Why is Charlie Brown trying to use a dip pen? <laughs> well, because it's a pen pal. What were you using? Pencils. I mean, kids oh, I were, wrote with pencils. Yeah, but ball, ball points yeah, around but at the DA, they, right? I mean, maybe I would I would have thought they were. Maybe they were just as common as like fountain pens and stuff. Or I don't know. August 29th, Charlie Brown is sitting writing to his pencil pal. He begins, Dear Pencil Pal, you are my only friend. Not counting you, I am friendless. I have no other friends. Your friend, Charlie Brown. He then thinks for a moment and adds, P.S. Everybody hates me. <laughs> I love this. I love that strip. I just think it's hilariously funny. Can you imagine being Charlie Brown's pen pal and getting no. that? Like, what do you write? You don't write back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not crazy about you either, kid. His pen pal in Russia. <laughs> Listening to Van Kleiberg records. <laughs> September 2nd, Charlie Brown is posting another letter, licking the envelope. Linus says, I wish I had a pencil pal like you, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says, well, it doesn't do much good if you can't read nor write. Linus contemplatively says, that's very true. Then walks away saying, only five years old and already I'm illiterate. Now, is this true? Is is Because Linus is some kind of genius and can do everything. Have we seen him reading or writing? He's still getting people to read him stories yeah. at this point. So yeah, I guess he, he says he's five, so he should be able to read by now. 
Oh, he's he's up to he's just up to five. So he was four last year. So he's move, moving up in the ranks. Even though so he's, he's tracking with Craig. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Craig being Schultz's son, who eventually went on to write the Peanuts movie that came out a few yeah. years ago, right? Which I think they did a I great did job on. September 3rd. Again, Charlie Brown is writing to his pencil pal. Dear pencil pal, how do you go to school? I ride in the school bus. I go to a big school. We learn a lot in our school. They teach us science, English, geography, arithmetic, history, and spelling. When I get big, I would like to drive a school bus. That's very typical of a little kid. I remember we we did a, a little session in, in grammar school on, on the difference between retail and wholesale. <laughs> And there was some kind of picture in the book about a, a big truck that was delivering to a store. And I thought, that's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> Back at the store, there's a place to park a truck you can carry from there. That's so funny. Uh, he, hadn't, this... he hadn't been exposed to E.B. White's elements of style or shrunken white at this point. <laughs> He wants to be a school bus driver. Every once in a while, I think about how weird my childhood is. And then I think, oh, it's so much weirder than I ever even allow people to know. I, we used to wear hunting knives, big buck knives on our belts to Catholic wow. school. Just wouldn't even think of it. And you think, well, that's the weirdest part of that story. And then you go, no, no, no. Because the weirdest part is they were sold to us by our bus driver. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> And then you think, well, that's the weirdest part. And you go, no, no, no. <laughs> they were sold to us by our bus driver, who was also the local police officer. Wow. <laughs> so I was actually there. So the police chief, who was a part time bus driver, was selling us weapons that we then wore to school. Wow. To kill, that was to fight my... off the demons. Yeah. I, I would just like to say this my childhood, I don't think, is. Um, something that we should all judge future childhoods on. I don't think that I'm using, I'm not using all these stories as boy, wasn't it good back then? I'm just telling you the way it was. <laughs> September 4th, Charlie Brown's writing to his pencil pal. He says, dear pencil pal, what are the girls like in your country? At that moment, Lucy comes in, dabbing her head. She's sweating. Boy, is it ever hot for this time of year? How can you write letters on a hot day like this? You must be out of your mind. She continues to rant. What this city needs is more swimming pools. Those city councilmen better get on the ball. Charlie Brown turns back to his letter and writes, Do you have many fuss budgets? <laughs> so, oh, so let's talk a little bit about the lettering on here. It's an interesting example of him varying the lettering so that we can see Charlie Brown's handwriting. And he has this technique, which is now kind of ubiquitous for someone who's writing a letter or writing anything that the letters just appear above the character's head. But I, I don't know that I've ever seen it previous to Schultz. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, there was another one of the sequence where he his letterings all over the place and he buys some line stationary and then the lettering is still all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I relate to as someone who has been nominated for best letterer at the Eisner's. If you looked at my notebooks, you would just think, <laughs> oh, this is an interesting artifact of some sort of art, outsider art. Because <laughs> <laughs> it does not look like, like a human is actually trying to convey information. It's just a scroll. Yeah, I can't help but think there's a little bit of that California heat first getting into the strip. <laughs> uh, that's probably true. Coming from Minnesota, suddenly you're like, wow still warm in September. September 7th, Lucy is hanging out at Schroeder's piano. She thinks to herself, sigh, there's nobody as fascinating as a musician. Well, it's now or never. Ahem, she says. Then she starts to flirt with Schroeder by saying, you know, Schroeder, he 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 he, if you ever wanted to he he he, lean over and kiss me, he 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 he, I wouldn't mind. Schroeder gets up. He's sickened by the whole thing. He thinks, good grief. I mean, he, 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 if he wanted to, he, 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 he. I mean, after all, there's nothing wrong with a little kiss between friends. As she says this, Snoopy walks up and kisses her on the ear. Lucy says, on the ear? Why, how quaint. How like a musician. She then turns and sees it's Snoopy. 
She yells, germs, disease, infection, as she runs away. Snoopy is insulted and says, I've never been so insulted in all my life. I have to insist we call this episode germs, disease, infection. (laughs) September 19th, Linus is sitting in his classic blanket pose, sucking his thumb, when suddenly a fly buzzes by. Like lightning, Linus strikes it out of the air with his blanket, then says to himself, fastest blanket in the West. This is part of a sequence. It is. Did I, did I tell you guys the thing when we went to the PCA, the, the Pop Culture uh-huh. Association no. meeting, which is usually like doctoral candidates having to give presentations to beef up their resumes? Um, Diane did one of these things. My wife, Diane, um, well, she was working on her her dissertation. And I just had free range to run around the to whatever of these hundreds of presentations uh, that were available in this sprawling complex uh and it was i think it was in san antonio but it was it, it, some of them were like incredibly erudite and you know they're talking about things i have no idea what what they're referring to but there was this one guy i don't know how he got into the festival he just showed up and said here's some comics i like and here's another funny one oh, can we get him on the show i like this one and that was like his whole presentation <laughs> September 28th, Linus is lying on the floor and looking at a book. He picks it up and takes it to his sister Lucy and says, Lucy, will you read this book to me? Lucy, who is playing with blocks, angrily says, no. Linus follows Lucy around saying, aw, come on. But Lucy is adamant, no. Please, begs Linus. Lucy is beyond frustrated, but she takes the book and says, a man was born, he lived and he died. The end, she says, as she tosses the book over her shoulder back to Linus. Linus looks at it and says, What a fascinating account. It almost makes you wish you had known the fellow. This is one of my all-time favorite strips. I- I've said, Mine too. What a fascinating account. Almost makes you wish you had known the fellow a lot of times uh, in my life. <laughs> October 12th. After a beautiful panel of Linus and Lucy, illustrated as if they are part of a jigsaw puzzle, we then see Lucy, who is just about finishing putting together a jigsaw puzzle, when Linus comes up, and he says, May I help you with your puzzle, Lucy? Lucy says, No. Besides, I'm almost done. Please? Oh, good grief. All right, here, you can put in the last piece. Linus is thrilled as she tosses him the last piece of the puzzle. He says, good. Now, let me see. How does it go? Does it fit like this? Or does it fit like this? Or maybe does it fit this way? Let's see now. Does it fit this way? Or this way? Or this way? Or maybe does it fit that way? Maybe it fits like this. Or around this way. Or maybe it fits this way. Or like this. Or maybe Lucy's had enough and screams, give me that piece! As she snatches it back from him. Linus sits there alone at the end and says, she never lets me help with anything. I actually know people like this. I do podcasts with people. It's frightening. (laughs) (laughs) Rather than actually do something, they sit there and like think about how they could do something for like hours. And then they never do it. Yeah, guilty. (laughs) Uh, By the way, that is one of the two most Harold things that really I read this year and thought, oh boy, is that Harold. And (laughs) and coming up is another one uh, in a little bit. Uh, But before that, We have to have Linus become a fanatic. So, (laughs) October 20th. Linus is hanging out in this classic blanket pose, talking with Violet. Violet looks up at the sky and she says, When I get big, I think I'll try to be an airplane hostess. Maybe I'll get to fly all over the world. Then she asks Linus, What do you want to be when you grow up, Linus? A fanatic. October 21st. Charlie Brown and Linus are walking down the street. Linus says, when I get big, I'm going to be a real fanatic. Charlie Brown asks, what are you going to be fanatical about, Linus? Linus says, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I'll be sort of a wishy-washy fanatic. October 23rd, Charlie Brown and Linus are standing out in the woods. Charlie Brown says, it's a beautiful day, isn't it, Linus? Linus yells at him, what about yesterday? And how about the day before? What was wrong with the day before? Linus walks away, a scowl on his face. A good fanatic is always ready for an argument. (laughs) 
And then it wraps up October 24th, back with Violet, who's looking at a picture of a movie star. And she says, look at the picture of this movie star. Doesn't he have nice hair? Linus yells, oh, I suppose you think I don't have nice hair. We can't all be movie stars, you know. I can't help it the way I look. I can't help it the way I was born. Then Linus turns to Charlie Brown and says, we fanatics are real touchy. I like this side of Linus. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> now, what do you think, Harold? Because this is not like your personality at all. What do you think when Linus goes off like this? Uh, he's trying something on for size. It doesn't it, it it doesn't have the nuance that we're used to with Linus, but he 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 finds out how to be fanatical later <laughs> with more more subtlety. <laughs> Yeah, because he's trying now, so it's not going to work. He's going to naturally become a fanatic around the Great Pumpkin and things. <laughs> and speaking of uh, Great Pumpkin, we've got a great Halloween strip here. October 31st. It's a pitch black night, and Linus and Lucy are out trick-or-treating. Lucy says, all you have to do is go up to the house, ring the bell, and say, tricks or treats. Linus says, I'm scared. What if somebody knifes me? Lucy says, nobody's going to knife you. Now get going. And she shoves him towards the house. As he's off trick-or-treating, Lucy's behind and says, Good grief, what a coward. Linus returns, a smile on his face, and says, You were right. It was real easy. There wasn't anybody home. Yeah, this is also so me. I <laughs> when he's, What if somebody knifes me? That is, uh, those are the kind of uh, objections I had as a small child when I was being pushed into things that I thought were unreasonable. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Peanuts is so often white space i love it when he we get a few night strips because i think the characters just look so great against that all black background yeah. hey so maybe you're out there you're an unpacking peanuts listener and you think gosh what's it like to like hang out with say harold and jimmy someday uh, what would it be like to have a be a fly on the wall of one of their conversations so i give you <laughs> november 2nd Linus is walking away from the table and he says, wow, I've never eaten so much chicken before in all my life. He's smiling. And then he goes to his sister, Lucy, who's sitting on her chair. And she says, this is a wishbone, Linus. She holds it up and explains to him, we both make our wishes and then we pull it apart. Whoever breaks off the biggest part gets his wish. Linus says, do we wish out loud? Lucy says, of course we wish out loud, which I actually don't think is correct. But for the sake of the joke, we have to wish out loud. So Lucy continues, if you don't wish out loud, the wish answerer won't know what to bring you. Linus says, I apologize for being so stupid, as he holds his part of the wishbone. Then they both hold it, and Lucy says, let's see now. I wish for a new doll, a new bicycle, four new sweaters, some new saddle shoes, a wristwatch, and about $100. Linus says, I wish for a long life for all my friends. I wish for peace in the world. I wish for greater advancements in the fields of science and medicine. And I, Lucy tosses the wishbone over her shoulder and says, you seem to have a knack for spoiling everything. <laughs> Which one is Harold? <laughs> I'm the wet security blanket. <laughs> it's so fun and so cute. And <laughs> I love Lucy just can't be that good. Like, <laughs> like he just, by just him being, <laughs> she's frustrated <laughs> because she's pure id and he is anything but. And it's, it's so much a better version of a strip than when it was just a mean kid saying something mean to someone who doesn't deserve it. This is, yeah. you understand both of these viewpoints. Yeah. You like both of these characters. And that makes it so rich and funny. And speaking of not so well drawn, the very next day, I don't need, you need to read this strip, but anybody who is following along, November 3rd has, again, there's just a little bit of wonk in Schultz's drawings this year occasionally. And if you take a look at Violet in panel three versus panel four, you, you kind of see what I'm talking about. Her jawline is really out of whack in the third panel. She's just sitting watching TV with Charlie Brown. And then he's got it right in the fourth mm -hmm. panel. And that, this just kind of stood out to me as stuff I didn't normally see. And actually the jawline in the first panel is also a little odd. He's being consistent from one and three, but I would say that the fourth panel is actually what you would expect Violet to look like. 
It was almost like somebody else had drawn this if we didn't know better. I have a real problem with that, especially when you're drawing, when I draw Amelia, because it has like the bowling ball head. If you look closely, or even not that closely, you'll all one side of the jaw is always off compared to the other. It's really hard to do something symmetrical and do it quickly. You know, which is what he's trying to do here. Which is, and he nails, you know, he nails the Charlie Brown head, which blows yeah. me away. I could never do the Charlie Brown head. And, and I, that's why I'm surprised at, you know, what would be a, a pretty curved line, right? On on, on the yeah. jawline of, of uh, Violet, but he's he's not doing that here. Mm -hmm. You know, what, all these television strips, do you think it, these would even register as televisions to a, a, a kid today? That's a good question. I mean, that could look, it could be a microwave on a stand. <laughs> Some of the ones that were the, the large, the large console TVs that Snoopy like sits on top of, I think it looks like a giant block of ice or something. I don't think a kid would even be able to go, oh yeah, that's a television. Could be a robot. Could be a robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It looks like a, the power droid from Snoopy. Yeah. I, I have a theory that the Schultz household now has at least two televisions. So this is the kid's television, the black and white set with the, it's more the, what the 13 inch. <laughs> Yeah, and then the mm -hmm. twenty-one inch or whatever, twenty-seven inch is the one that's uh, in the main household. That is a console that goes all the way to the floor, like Snoopy was on top of. Uh, yeah, I got uh, a television set for my room right around the time of the Atari console became such a big thing, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the most generous thing my parents have ever done. And I realized they just didn't want me hogging the television all the time. <laughs> How old were you? Uh, 10, 10. So Michael, did you ever have your own TV or were you always sharing within the family? Uh, eventually I did, but I was a little older. Yeah. I think I was a t early teenager. Maybe when I had had the moments yeah. where I could, yeah. I, I was, I think it was in high school by the time I had like a dedicated. I just got the, the leftovers when we got, <laughs> right, when we got right. the color TV. I got the old black and white. Yeah. Now I think, yeah. you know, you got, if you have a phone, you got, everything now yeah it, but it was a, yeah there's a lot of restriction though today right you know what what kids can and can't do just like we had growing up maybe more so in some cases right well definitely in some cases I, I, in the in the sense of running around in the neighborhood and just oh, having gosh, like yeah. day long adventures that's gone uh you know there are parts of amelia that looks like you know high fantasy to a kid these days because they couldn't imagine it november 14th Lucy and Charlie Brown are hanging out at the wall. Charlie Brown says, I wish I could be happy. I think I could be happy if my life had more purpose to it. I also think that if I were happy, I could help others to be happy. Does that make sense to you? Lucy says, we've had spaghetti at our house three times this month. Charlie Brown says, good grief. That is the greatest non sequitur ever. Yeah. <laughs> I've, used, I've used that a lot of times. I, I have too. I have too. That is just so funny. And that is, I, that might very well be an observation uh, with his kid where you're trying to say something to the kid and the kid's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But the kid's just thinking about what they're thinking about and waiting to talk. Yeah. Or maybe a little sadder, maybe, maybe his spouse. Yes. Or oh, no. Adults in general. <laughs> really funny. November 21st. Snoopy is a vulture and he's sitting perched high in a tree for three panels in the third panel an actual vulture sits next to him freaking snoopy out who runs home <laughs> now here's schultz like the greatest cartoonist ever he doesn't draw other animals very well i don't think i don't think that's a good drawing of a vulture i i love that drawing of a vulture because it's Snoopy has his idea of what a vulture is, and we've been watching it for days and days. And then when the actual vulture shows up, it looks like Snoopy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's my question. What's happening in panel three? Is the vulture there because he's like, hey, there's another vulture? Or is the vulture there like, hey, man, <laughs> this is cultural appropriation. Back it up. <laughs> <laughs> or or he's, uh, he's interested in a little carry on. I don't know. December 12th, Snoopy is asleep on top of his doghouse, which, right. by the way, we see at a three-quarter angle, so we can see it's a pointed roof. In panel two, he slides off it. In panel three, he lands on the ground. And in panel four, Snoopy, shaken from hitting the ground so hard, says, life was full of rude awakenings. So there's an historic moment. Yeah, yeah, totally historic. Notice, well, 
it's it's obvious why he always uses the side view because he's got the doghouse in three quarter view and Snoopy in side view on the <laughs> first panel. That's really weird, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, all we have is that little ear angling down on the roof to give you some sense of perspective there. Schultz would say that the ears would lock onto the sides of the doghouse, keeping him perched up there. That makes total sense. I buy it. Absolutely. December 21st. The whole gang is on stage. It's a Christmas pageant. A couple of the kids in the chorus say, We are here to tell you of a wondrous light. Linus is nervous on the end and he thinks to himself, I'm sunk. Shermy continues speaking. A wondrous light that was a star. Linus thinks to himself, I wonder if there's any way I can get out of here. Then Lucy says, the wise men saw the star and followed it from afar. Linus, out of the corner of his mouth, says, Psst, Lucy. Then Charlie Brown continues. They found the stable in the night beneath the star so big and bright. Lucy, out of the corner of her mouth, says, What's the matter? Linus says, I can't remember my piece. Patty says, the wise men left the presents there, gifts so precious and so rare. Lucy says, what do you mean you can't remember it? Linus, I can't remember it. Pigpen, looking very dashing, all cleaned up, says, <laughs> look up, look up. The star still stands, seen by millions in many lands. Lucy to Linus, you better remember it right now, you blockhead, or when we get home, I'll slug you a good one. Linus shouts out the star that shone at bethlehem still shines for us today then passes out lucy from the corner of her mouth says merry christmas linus says thank you <laughs> <laughs> now i've never seen the christmas special nor do i want to but i i'm guessing this was no nope. part of it 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 actually was not nope. um but boy do i remember this strip from just the collections this stands out. I think it's in that Peanuts Jubilee on their 25th anniversary. Yeah. It was featured in it. And it is one of my favorite strips. I mean, again, being so Linus-y, I, I, I could totally relate. There are a few things that are similar, uh, Michael. In fact, there's a little bit of trivia about this strip. This is actually the second part of a, uh, of a strip that started in Better Homes and Gardens magazine. Wow. Really? Yeah they hired him to to do a, a 12 panel strip. And so he starts with it's Lucy and Linus uh, in their house and she's helping him memorize the lines. And uh, so there is a brief thing in the Christmas special, Michael, where, where it's, it's similar, where, where Linus says, I can't memorize these lines. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, ah. so it's, it's, I can't remember if that's actually in the better homes and gardens version. I don't think it is. But uh, so you're saying the complete peanut is not the complete peanut. It's not it the complete, not the complete peanuts. peanuts. This was the first kind of tie in of its apparently better homes and gardens had asked him to put in on something where they were asking famous people questions of philosophy. And apparently Schultz replied to whatever that previous uh, assignment was with something where he was, he took it very seriously. He quotes scripture, this and that. And the editor's like, this is not what I was looking for. And they didn't run. It. <laughs> and they said, can, can, can I, I change this? I, I changed what you're saying, your reply. Can I put this in? And Schultz is like, either you run it the way I sent it, or you can just forget the whole yeah. thing. And so he, he wasn't in there. And then they came back to him. They remembered him and said, well, let's, why don't we give him a Christmas thing to do then? And this was, this was the result uh, for these two strips. But, uh, man, this is such a classic strip to me. It's so, I mean, Linus has just blossomed this year and uh, is so much the character that I know and love and relate to. At well, this do point. you realize how many of these strips that we picked from this year are Linus strips? Yeah. It's crazy. Right. But as we know, he's the most complex and greatest character in the history of Western literature. And he can't even read or write. Nope. Yet. But he can color. <laughs> December 28th, we see Linus decked out <laughs> as if he's a miniature Picasso. And behind him is an array of his drawings uh, and some, some crayons. We see like a, a little boy, maybe in his dog. We see a cowboy. We see a tank or a, or no, it's a tractor, I guess, actually. And uh, these are obviously things Linus has drawn. In the second panel, we see him snapping a crayon in two as Lucy looks on. Lucy is outraged. She yells at him, you broke all my crayons in half. Are you out of your mind? Linus says, no, I don't think so. 
Of course, I haven't taken any actual intelligence tests lately, so I... You're going to drive me crazy, says Lucy as she shakes Linus. Then she drags him by his shirt collar, grabs a thing of glue, and says, Here, now get to work. Then we see Linus um, sitting amidst the pieces of crayons, and he says to Charlie Brown, Have you ever tried to glue crayons together? The thing that makes this particular strip for me is Lucy screaming at him, are you out of your mind? And, and and Linus just looks at her sincerely with his hand to his chin. No, I don't think so. Of course, I haven't taken any actual intelligence tests lately, so I... <laughs> and that's something you wouldn't see in another strip where you have essentially like a sub-joke. Yeah, right. That is just classic, classic Linus playing off of Lucy so beautifully. And this is, again, you should really be following us uh, along at gocomics.com. Just type in peanuts. You can search these dates. Also, if you want, you can sign up for the Great Peanuts Reread through our website, unpackingpeanuts.com. And we'll give you a heads up every two weeks um, for what strips we're going to be discussing. Uh, Because it's worth seeing them in advance. The, The drawings in this one are really, really funny and just makes the overall strip that much funnier i love i love the first panel how do you like that that panel when she's shaking him you're driving me crazy me and like four four crayon bits somehow are falling from his hair <laughs> <laughs> great lettering throughout all this as well and i have to say i have a phobia of crayon paper the feel of the paper on crayola crayons uh because i, I was in a situation not unlike linus <laughs> at a very young age and it scarred me to this day I can't draw with Crayola crayons. (laughs) So guys, this has been so fun. This has been a great year. Uh, 1958 is my favorite year so far. And you know what? I suspect it's going to get even better next Mm -hmm. year. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to follow along with this conversation, you can check us out on social media at where unpack peanuts at both Instagram and Twitter. Or you could also uh, just go to our website, unpackingpeanuts.com. You could drop us a line, sign up for that great peanuts reread. We would love to hear from you. Did we miss one of your favorite strips? Uh, did we get something wrong? Did we get something so right that you're moved to, to write and tell us? Uh, all of those things we would love to hear. And we'll be back next week for 1959. But before then, guys, what is your nomination for strip of the year right. and you can also on unpacking peanuts you can check that out right and vote along with us and see that's right which of these three nominees do you like the best all right michael what is your pick for strip of the year i am going for september 7th just because oh, you had the 28th you're changing. yeah i'm changing my mind because germs disease infection is my favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> great pick harold how about you i have to make it the christmas strip this is just one that i I, it just shape shapes me as a kid i just have such strong memories of what this strip meant to me as a kid and it's just as fresh and wonderful as i remember it those are both great picks with a second place nod going to the wishbone strip I am going to give strip of the year to January 5th. Good grief. Yeah, I thought it was sense. the fallout. And by the way, mine is a uh, December 21st. If anyone's looking things up. So go on unpacking and uh, uh, let us know what you think is the best strip of the year. As always, I'm just so grateful uh, that you guys listen to this podcast, that we get to talk about this great comic strip. And I'm so grateful I get to do it with my pals and two cartoonists that I just admire so much. Uh, I hope everybody comes back next week for 1959. Until then, for Michael and Harold, I'm Jimmy. Be of good cheer. Yes, Yes. be Be of good good cheer. cheer. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. Oops.